morning. <clears throat> My name is Polly Pistol, and I'm an alcoholic. By God's grace, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, I haven't had a drink since uh, April the 11th, 1977, and for that I am eternally grateful. I have a home group, and that's Monday night Seal. Oh, that's Monday night Seal Beach Speakers Meeting. When I said that, that's a Freudian slip. That's my California home group. <laughs> I live in Washington State now, so uh, is the third legacy group, and we meet on Monday night in Bellingham, Washington. And I have a sponsor, and my sponsor has a sponsor. And those are the things that I need to be a good member in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd like to start off by saying thank you, thank you, a million thank yous for letting Dave and I come here. This has absolutely been fabulous. And uh, it's a beautiful country, but the deal is, is it you. You guys are the best. You rock. You guys are just great. So thank you for letting us come to Denmark and uh, enjoy your fellowship and be a part of your conference. It's, it's a privilege any time I have an opportunity to share in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So thank you again. Uh, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that I should share it in a general way. What it used to be like, what happened, and what I'm trying to be like today. And I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. I want to start off by telling you that I love my life. I love the life that Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. I love what you've given me and the kind of life I get to live today. And because of that, I am busier in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous than I have ever been. I'm into more service than I've ever been into, and I sponsor more people than I've ever sponsored because with 27 years of sobriety, I have so much to lose. And I want to keep what I have. And I know that the only way I can keep it is keep doing what I'm doing. And I don't do a lot different today than I did when I was a newcomer 27 years ago. I do pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> I also want you to know that I am living, breathing proof that you can come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and not come from alcoholic parents. I do not come from the disease of alcoholism. My father died at age 60, and he had 60 years of sobriety. My mother is 86 years old, and she has 86 years of sobriety. And my mother is not the least bit impressed with my 27 years of sobriety. <laughs> Her deal is, is if you hadn't a drink, none of those things would have happened to you anyway. I did not grow up with alcohol, so it's not anything I knew anything about. Now, they say, take an alcoholic's family tree, give it a shake, and an alcoholic will fall out. Now, if that's the case, it would be my grandfather, my mother's father. Now, I'm here to tell you, I don't believe he was an alcoholic. I don't know, because I was pretty young when he died. I think I was in my 20s. But the only, he was the only one in our family who drank. But I don't ever recall him drinking the way I drank. So I did not know anything growing up about the disease of alcoholism. I didn't see people drunk. I came from parents who loved me. I am not an abused child. I sponsor so many women who have had terrible things happen to them as little girls. And I've heard in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous the terrible things that have happened to little boys as well. But none of those things happened to me. I got sober in treatment and I would hear these horrible stories and I would say, well, gosh, I know why you're an alcoholic, but why am I an alcoholic? I just didn't get it because I came from a lot of love. And not only that, I'm an only child. So I had it all. I had all of my parents' attention. But today I understand a lot of things I didn't understand. And one of those things is thanks to step four. Anybody around here working on step four? Fun step. 
That's a step where we get to learn about ourselves and I get to know myself. And what I learned was, is in order for me to know about who and what I am, I have to know who and who and what my parents were. And what I've learned is, is both of my parents were abused children. And it's just like an alcoholic and an Al-Anon, we find each other. You know, it's like there could be a hundred men out there, and I'm going to find the Al-Anon. Because I need somebody to take care of me. So that's what my parents found each other. And what I know today is, as much as they tried to give me all the things they wanted me to have, self-esteem, self-worth, all those things, what I know today is you cannot give that what you do not have. And they could not give that to me because they didn't have. I also know today what's wrong with me. You see, I'm a person who was loved all my life. I just finished reading a book not too long ago that's called How It Worked, and it's about Clarence Snyder's life, and he's one of the one of the of uh, our very old old members. He started started AA in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. And Clarence Snyder, this the author that's writing about him, says there appears to be two characteristics that cause alcoholism. Being loved too much are not enough. <laughs> that's who we are. But what I have found out about me is I certainly, if there was any abuse, I was probably loved too much. Because my parents tried to give me everything, loving material, everything they could give me. But what happened was, is I never could feel it. No matter how much they loved me, I couldn't feel it. I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I would have sworn nobody loved me. But what I know today, thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, is that I know what's wrong with me. I have a spiritual malady. My disease is spiritual in nature. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I have a disease that's hopeless of mind and body. Today I know that I have a spiritual illness and the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is a spiritual solution. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I am suffering from a spiritual malady. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I am separated from the sunshine of the spirit. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that if I am suffering from a spiritual malady, nothing is enough. You cannot love me enough. You cannot give me enough. You cannot do enough. There simply is not enough for an alcoholic like me. When I was 18 years old, I married an Air Force officer. And I just knew that I had found my knight in shining armor and we were going to sail off into the sunset and live happily ever after. Now, I had married a sack pilot. And uh, that's, those are pilots who, that's the Strategic Air Command in the United States. And these are the pilots who drive uh, bomb, bomb air, B-52s, airplanes that drop bombs, bombers. And uh, I don't think you guys know too much about that, and that's wonderful. <laughs> but uh, so he was military, and I married this man, and I just knew that he was going to take care of me. Because, you see, I'm one of these people that has never wanted to take care of myself. I have always wanted somebody else to be responsible for me. And I knew that if I just had money, men, and mansions, I'm going to be okay. And I needed him to take care of me. Well, what I found out was, is this man was going to be gone, and he was going to be gone a lot. He was going to be gone for years at a time. And I was going to have to learn to be responsible for myself, and I didn't know how to do that. When we first got into the Air Force, I got this invitation in the mail, and it was from the base commander's wife. And the invitation was for me to attend a coffee. 
And this coffee was for all of us brand new little second lieutenant's wives. And this base commander's wife was going to tell us what we were expected to do in the military in order to enhance our husband's career. We were going to go to the right dinner parties. We were going to have the right dinner parties. We would be attending the right functions. We would dress properly. We'd wear the right length gloves. We were told exactly what we were supposed to do. Now, I am 18 years old, and I am uneducated. I have a high school education. And I just know that these other women are sophisticated and educated, and I am just overwhelmed by feelings of inadequacy. How am I going to measure up to these women? How can I possibly communicate with them? If I open my mouth, they're going to find out how stupid I am. Now, I want you to know today I still have a high school education. And I believe that you can come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and be and do anything you want to be and do. And I've learned a lot about myself through the fourth step. I've found out that I have a character defect called slothing. And what I have found out about myself is I've always wanted those letters after my name, but I've just never wanted to go to school. So what I found out was is that that was my excuse. Well, I'm just too stupid. I can't carry on a conversation. Yet I was never willing to take any action to change that. So these are the things that I get to know about myself as I stay around the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And what happened was is while I was around these women, I was just overtaken by feelings of inadequacy. There's no way I can measure up. And I couldn't speak. I just didn't have a voice. I was so terrified. The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that we're people that are driven by a hundred forms of fear. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. And not too long after that, after we had that meeting, I went to a luncheon. And at that luncheon, I took a drink of alcohol. And I had never had a drink of alcohol. And I don't remember anything really happening. You guys heard Dave talk on Friday night. And Dave talked about, you know, all of a sudden he was six foot tall and his red hair turned brown and his freckles fell off. You know, all these things happened to him. But that didn't happen to me. I don't recall anything really happening. All I knew was is when I took a drink of alcohol, I seemed to be able to breathe. I could just breathe. And I seemed to be able to nod in the right places and laugh in the right places. I seemed to be able to do things and be able to fit in socially where before I was so terrified I couldn't stand in my, I just couldn't stand my own skin. I had no idea at that point in time what, what alcohol was doing for me. And it wasn't until I came into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I read the doctor's opinion that I knew what alcohol had done for me. Alcohol had given me that feeling of ease and comfort. When I took a drink of alcohol, I could just breathe and fit in. I had that ease and comfort to be able to function in situations that I was too terrified to function in. Along about 1962, we're stationed in a place called Loring Air Force Base, and that Air Force Base is at the very tippy top of Maine, and it's really, really cold there. Now, it might get this, as cold as that here. I don't know. But 50 or 60 below zero Fahrenheit was not an uncommon thing. And I had two little boys. And I had no clue how to be a parent. I did not know anything about children. And these two little boys were driving me crazy. I was having a nervous breakdown every 20 minutes. And I couldn't send them out to play because it was too cold. So I had these children around all the time with no tools to be a parent. And I ended up going to an Air Force doctor and he said, take these. And from 1962 until 1977, when I entered the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, 
I took Librium and Valium and Secanol and Nimutol and drank alcohol. Now that's tranquilizers, barbiturates, and alcohol. And I guarantee you if you take those kind of drugs and <clears throat> drink alcohol, you are not an active alcoholic. I call myself a couch potato alcoholic because I did my dying on my living room sofa. I just laid there and watched soap operas and listened to Joe Baez sing the blues. <clears throat> There's a chapter in our big book in Alcoholics, our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's called The Family Afterwards. And a lot of times we don't pay enough attention to that chapter. Because one of the things I'm here to tell you, it is my opinion, the book talks about it, this is a family disease. And anybody who lives with a practicing alcoholic is affected by the disease of alcoholism. And the disease of alcoholism traumatizes children. Our children pay a huge price for the disease of alcoholism. I am an alcoholic mother. My children have paid a terrible price for the disease of alcoholism. Today, I would not be allowed to have my children. My children would have been taken from me because, you see, I am a child abuser. I have abused my children emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And I didn't mean to do it. It wasn't something I set out to do. But because of a disease called alcoholism, I could not care for my children. I was irritable, restless, and discontent. And my children got on my nerves, and I just couldn't deal with them. And also, I couldn't take care of my children. And I couldn't get up in the morning and make them breakfast. I couldn't put them to bed at night. I absolutely could not care for my children. After I had finished my four step, my AA sponsor looked at me and he said, Polly, you're a child abuser. And you're going to go to those boys and you're going to make amends. And you're not going to say things to them like, I'm sorry you were hurt. He says, that's entirely too lame. That's not what you're going to do. You're going to go to those boys and you're going to tell them that you're a child abuser and that you're going to spend the rest of your life making amends to them. And the family afterwards, it tells us, we cannot write this in a lifetime. I've got to be the very best mom I can be forever. That's what I get to do. That's my amends. And I went to my sons, and he said, your boys are going to have a lot to say to you. And whatever they say, you don't say things such as, you shouldn't feel that way. I'm sober today. He says, what you say to them is, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. And I'll do the best I can to be the very best mom I can be. And my sons were 14 and 16 years old when I got sober. And they were angry. They were very angry. And they had a lot to say. And I sat there and I listened. And I didn't know if I could stand it. The pain was so great. And I was told, you know, there's three parts to the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And the second part is the courage to change the things I can. And I want you to know by taking direction from a sponsor, taking sponsorship direction that I didn't believe would work, but doing it because I was told to do it, I have a relationship today with my sons that is beyond my greatest expectation. This disease, we all, this is, this disease, the disease of alcoholism kills, and it kills people who don't even drink. This disease ter just tears families apart. But this program is a program of recovery, 
and the families recover, we got sick together, and we get to get well together. That's the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous. And most of the time, it begins with us. You know, we come here, and we, you know, the family is all torn apart, and we're the ones getting sober. And slowly, but slowly, but slowly, because we do what the book says and the steps, our families begin to get better. The miracle of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of Al-Anon. I'm going to tell you a few things that got me to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want you to know that uh, I don't have any really racy stories to tell you. I did all my affairs sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't have all those fun stories to tell because I slept through them. So, but I'd like to tell you a few things that brought me to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a car wreck in Irving, Texas, right where the Dallas Cowboys play football. You probably never, some of you probably don't even know who that is. But anyway, it's a big football team in the States. And uh, I had a car wreck right by their uh, football stadium. And I'm a blackout drinker, so I call the police and I tell them that my car was stolen. And here comes the police and my husband's with the police. And I'm taken to the Irving police station. And I get to see that look in the non-alcoholic's face that just doesn't understand why we do the things we do. And this policeman looked at my husband with so much disgust. And he said, why don't you just take her home and sober her up? And on the way home, my husband said, Polly, there's a treatment center. And it's not far from our house and I wish you would go. And that night I entered treatment for the first time. And this was a county detox. This was definitely not a fancy treatment center. And while I was here, it was a seven day detox. While I was there, I fell in love with the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I loved the laughter. I loved the joy. I loved you. I loved the fellowship. But there was something down inside of me that said, Polly, People like you don't become alcoholic. And, uh, and I had what we, call in, what we call in America when you fall in love you know, in a treatment center, we call it a jitter house romance. And I had a jitter house romance. And you know, we walked off into happy destiny for 58 days. And, uh, and I was 12-stepped and brought back into that treatment center more dead than alive. And I had been beaten up and many things had happened to me in this motel where I was 12 stepped out of. And when I was brought back into that treatment center, and I, I had reached that place in the big book that talks about pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Because now I knew what the problem was. The problem was sobriety. Clancy has a tape that's in the States, and I'm, you may have heard it, maybe it's on your website, that he did many years ago, and it's called Alcoholism, a Disease of Perception. And what I've learned from that tape is, is my perception of reality is distorted. I don't see things the way they really are. I don't hear things the way they really are. I can still remember my mother saying things to me like, Polly, wherever did you get that idea? Nobody said that to you. But I would have swore they said that to me because I hear and see things that aren't there. I am totally out of touch with reality. I need you to keep me in touch with reality. On that tape, Alcoholism, a Disease of Perception, he also talks about the disease of alcoholism. And the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that alcohol is but a symptom. Alcohol is a but a symptom of my disease. I have to get down to the causes and conditions. And what happens to me is I die without the program of Alcoholics Anonymous if I don't have alcohol. And I'm sitting in this treatment center, and what I said to myself was, sobriety is the problem. I can't live sober. I can't live inside my skin sober. I can't stand it. Sober, 
I know what kind of mother I am. Sober, I know what kind of daughter I am. Sober, I know what kind of wife I am. And I cannot stand the woman I have become. I can't bear what has happened to me. And I know that I can't live sober. See, I don't understand that if I'll come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll show me how to live sober. You'll give me the steps and the tools so that I can learn to live with my past and let it be my greatest asset. But I don't know this. And all I know is I can't live with this. I cannot bear to be sober. And what happened was, is when they let me out of that hospital, when that seven-day detox was up, I got a bottle of scotch, and I got a bottle of Valium, and I checked into a motel. I absolutely could not live another moment. I don't believe that there's anybody in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous that doesn't have an angel in your life. Someone that leads us to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Maybe it's your wife or your husband who says, if you don't stop drinking, you can't live here. Maybe you're here because your job intervened and said, if you don't sober up, you can't work here. Whatever the reason is, somehow, some way, we're led to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had such a person in my life, and she knew nothing about the disease of alcoholism, but she loved me. And she said that day that something came over her, and she had to find me. And today I know what that something was. That was God working in my life through her. And she drove around until she found my car parked outside this motel. And I hadn't shut the door. It was just kind of just barely closed. And she pushed it open, and she found me laying there. And on April the 8th of 1977, I was pronounced dead on arrival in a hospital in Bedford, Texas. By God's grace and divine intervention, I'm here this morning. I believe that God divinely intervenes on us. Here we sit this morning, and there's only one difference between us and the drunk that's laying out on the street, and that's the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are so blessed here. We are given the gift of grace, and grace in Webster's Dictionary says a gift unearned. We have done nothing to earn this gift. This is a free gift that has been handed to us. And it's handed to so many alcoholics. They come walking through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. The gift is given to them. They turn around, lay the gift in the seat, and walk out. Do you know how many people come here and how few stay? We have a daily reading and our daily reflection. And what that reading says... Sobriety is God's gift to me. What I do with my sobriety is my gift back to God. There is never enough I could do for God to repay the gift I have been given of sobriety. Because you see, I've done nothing to earn this gift. By God's grace, I have been willing to suit up and show up and take a seat and Alcoholics Anonymous. By God's grace, I have been willing to take direction. By God's grace, I picked up the steps and I worked them. And it was through the steps that I had a spiritual awakening. I was uh, put on one of what we call in the States um, a psychiatric hold. It's a 72-hour hold which was enough time for my husband to obtain a court order from a Fort Worth judge that said I was a detriment to myself and others and I was court committed to treatment. I entered a treatment center in Dallas, Texas on April the 11th of 1977. And by God's grace in this beautiful program, I'm here today. And uh, just a week ago, I celebrated 27 years of sobriety. And that's a great event. Thank you.
The Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous on page 164 in A Vision for You says that if we stay spiritually fit, that great events will come to pass. That's the great fact for us all. It will happen. And I would like to spend the time I have left here telling you about my great events that have come to pass. I got sober in a treatment center. I know so many of you got sober in a treatment center. And I'm grateful I got sober in a treatment center. But I can guarantee you I would not be standing here 27 years later if it were not for the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. The 12 steps, the 12 traditions, and the 12 concepts. It is through that recovery that I've been able to stay sober 27 years. Strong sponsorship, and through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, I have had a spiritual awakening and have a relationship today with God beyond my greatest expectation. I knew about God. I was raised in the Baptist church. I went to Sunday school on Sunday morning, church on Sunday, church on Sunday night, and church on Wednesday. I mean, I was in church, and I knew about God. But I'll tell you, my, the God I knew about was this God that was going to get you. All I knew about was sin. You know, I knew all God wanted to do was kill me. I believed that I, all I heard was, you're going to burn in hell. And things like, if you've thought it, you've done it. And I don't know about any of you, but I was an alcoholic in the making, and I thought a lot. And I just didn't, you know, I'm just, he's going to get me. And I'm just, you know, it was just, I, I didn't understand my perception. I didn't hear what they were trying to say. I didn't hear it. And I come to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and you begin to talk to me about another God, a God that loves me, a God that's within all these people. And today, God, as I understand him, speaks to me through the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have never had a fax from God, but he always sends me one of you. I am so grateful for the God I know today. My mother used to say, we live in a God-fearing home. Well, I tell you today, Dave and I live in a God-loving home. The graces that we have found here. God loves us. God loves me as if I were his only child. And I didn't even know that before I came here. That I am so blessed. One of the things that I know today is, is that I never could live life on life's terms. Now, I got sober and people would talk from podiums and they'd say, I got sober, I got a new car, I got a new job, I got a new house. And all these things would be, you know, it's like all of a sudden everything's wonderful. That is not my story. Okay? What I have been given is the tools to live life on life's terms. I never could do life. I have never ever wanted to suit up and show up for life because life was just too hard. I just didn't want to do it. And because of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been able to live life on life's terms. I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and I got busy. And I've been, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of newcomers this weekend working on this conference. And I love it. And I'm always teasing them. I'm walking up to them and I see these brooms and, these, and they're moving chairs. And I'll say, you just keep that broom, you're going to stay sober. And because I got busy in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I began, began to give to this program, and I was told to get busy, do something. You're selfish and self-centered. Get busy, do something. Get your mind off yourself. And my AA sponsor says, Polly, it's not that you think well of yourself, it's just you think only of yourself. <laughs> get busy. Do something for somebody else. You know, psychologists and psychiatrists go crazy with us. Because have you ever heard this, if you've ever gone to one? Do it for yourself. 
Doing it for myself got me that seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. It wasn't until I started doing it for you that I started to feel better. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I'm to be of maximum service to God and those about me. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says I'm to have constant thoughts of others. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that if I am not working with others, I will not survive the high and low spots of life. It tells me to be others focused. Keep, reach out. We are spiritually ill, and the way I heal from a spiritual malady is to reach out and help another person, and then it comes back to me. You hear a lot of times in Alcoholics Anonymous, come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and let us love you till you can love yourself. I'd like to give you another twist. Come into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and let us love you till you can love somebody else. Because it's not about... I want you to know that if I'd have waited till I loved myself to give this program away, I'd still be waiting. <laughs> I can still get, wake up every morning the same way. I don't know about any of you, but I still have a really busy head. I don't know if your head talks to you. If you're a newcomer, it's, you know, if you tell somebody who's not an alcoholic, they probably think you need to go to one of those funny places. But if you tell one of us, oh, yeah, I know, mine does that too. I would love, I mean, we were at, you know, I, I woke up this morning at 1.30 and couldn't go back to sleep. I really think that Dave was awake and so was Moss. We should have just got up and had a head party, you know. I mean, that's what happens. Busy, 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 busy heads. Normal for folks like you and me. You go tell a psychiatrist that you hear voices all night, they're going to lock you up. <laughs> We're just going to say, yeah, we know. Yeah, we know. We all have it. <laughs> Thanks to this program, I know what the solution is and that is to help somebody else. I can still wake up in the morning and know that nobody loves me. I'm going to get fired from my job. Well, fortunately, I don't have to work anymore. But I'm going to get fired from my job. I'm going to die of some unknown disease. I mean, that's what my head is telling me. So I start saying my prayers. I pick up the phone. I call another alcoholic, and things get better. If I want self-esteem, go do an esteemable act. If I want self-worth, do something worthy. Go take an action. Into action. That's what one of our chapters in the big book. Into action. Get busy and do something. We are not people who should be left alone with our head. It's a dangerous place. <laughs> So I got busy and I started doing things and making coffee and cleaning coffee cups and sweeping floors and doing all the stuff we do in Alcoholics Anonymous and sobriety started to come. And uh, my great events started to happen and I began to be happy and sober and I was work began working the steps and doing the things I was told to do in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to love people and love to be around people, and I wasn't so afraid anymore. And I have, I'm not a person who ever could get up in front of a group and talk to people. I was absolutely too terrified to even begin to do such a thing. I was entirely driven by too much fear. But today I can do that because you've shown me how to do that.
You just get up here. I don't have to do anything. I just show up and ask God to help me. My job is to show up. I learned that the step before step one is get in the car. Now, if I was in Denmark, it's get on a bicycle. <laughs> but get in the car. <laughs> and just say, where are we going? Well, just you just get in the car. You don't need, you, we're just going. You just get in the car. And so if somebody in Denmark tells you to get on a bicycle, just get on a bicycle and go. Go wherever they tell you to go. And the magic starts to happen. When I was three years sober, I had my husband and I divorced. And we had been married for 22 years. And we divorced. And uh, I did not believe that that would ever happen, but it did. And it was just something I believed you weren't supposed to do. And uh, we divorced. And a few months later, I married my best friend. And Dave and I had been friends in Alcoholics Anonymous since I was six months sober and he was a year and a half sober. And we were AA friends, no hanky-panky. I had a lot of hanky-panky, but it wasn't with Dave. <laughs> and I was, I got sober and I had to hit a bottom sober. And that was behind relationships and sex. I just went crazy because, you see, I was sober and I needed somebody to love me. And I didn't understand anything about love. And I, I hit a bottom of so much shame in this program. And I don't recommend that. I don't recommend that. And uh, Dave and I were friends. In fact, Dave sponsored a lot of the men that I was too good of friends with. <laughs> and uh, when I was, Dave came to me and he said, Polly, I'm in love with you. And he says, but you need to get something straight. I don't want to have an affair with you. I want to marry you. And see, things like that aren't supposed to happen to women like me. And uh, I want you to know, October the 27th, Dave and I were married 23 years. And that's a great event that's come to pass. Dave and I did not know how to have a marriage. We both knew how to take a hostage, but we didn't know how to have a marriage. <laughs> and as Dave's told you, I'm his fourth wife, so he... He just didn't know how to stay married. And I was on, you know, I am an Al-Anon too. I'm 21 years an Al-Anon as well. So I know how to suffer. <laughs> so I suffered for 22 years. And, but neither one of us knew how to have a marriage. So we began to ask people to help us. And Dave told you the little story yesterday about the two oak trees and how you plant yourself firmly in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and you, you nurture yourself with the steps and the traditions and the concepts and then just like those two oak trees, you grow strong but separate. And then one day you look up and you can't tell where one begins and the other one ends. And then we learned about those traditions. And the traditions we shared with you all day yesterday are not anything that we, that's not original from us. Those were given to us. We don't have an original idea. Everything we have was given to us by somebody else. And all we're doing is just passing it on. Just passing it on. And we hope you take what we've given you and pass it on to somebody else. That's the way this deal works. Just pass it on. And Dave and I were begun to give things that we were told. Things like the magic words. Please forgive me. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. Those kind of words that we didn't know anything about. Say you're sorry and you're not even the one who's wrong. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, I make amends whether they're real or fancied. It doesn't matter who's wrong. Somebody's got to say they're sorry in order to get off dead center. It doesn't matter. And I was told by Dave's AA sponsor, Polly, what do you want to be? You want to be right or do you want to be happy? What do you want to be? And Dave and I began to have a marriage. And it became good. 
And then we had some things began to happen like stepchildren. Dave has two and I have two. Put those four kids together, what an order. I can't go through with it. You talk about put a strain on a marriage, put a bunch of kids together, and then find out three of them are alcoholics and drug addicts. That'll get a little exciting. And Dave and I didn't, you know, we, we had to go to people and ask how to do this, and we began to work through that. And then we began to, to watch our kids get sober. And two of our children got sober. One of them got sober 20 years ago. My, oldest, my youngest son is 20 years sober. Great events that come to pass. And then Dave and I started to experience some things in Alcoholics Anonymous that's not a lot of fun. In 1993, the bottom fell out of uh, aerospace in the United States, and Dave lost his job. And... Uh, it didn't look like he was going to find a job. And there was just not any jobs from computer scientists. And, and what happened was is we ended up losing our house. And we ended up having to file bankruptcy and the shame and degradation of that. And I just thought, how can this happen? This is the kind of stuff that's supposed to happen to newcomers, not to people who are 16 and 17 years sober. And I was ashamed of that. And I'd go to Dave's sponsor and I'd say, what are people going to think of us? And he says, Polly, it's none of your business what people think of you. But your very life depends on what you think of them. Your job is to tell the truth and be of service in Alcoholics Anonymous. That's your job. The rest of it will take care of itself. So I had to stand up and be honest about that. And I didn't want to. Because I was so embarrassed and ashamed. But you know what? Dave and I learned a huge lesson from that. What we found out is, is that you can lose everything. But as long as we have each other and we have AA, we have it all. Just stuff. It was just stuff. We still have our sobriety and we still have our marriage. And God showed us what's important. Because we never, ever turned from God, and we never turned from AA. My children started having a lot of problems. My son James was a full-blown drug addict at 14, and I just couldn't, I mean, how can this be happening? Now I'm sober in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know what to do with him. My life was coming apart. And... Uh, what I did is I ended up walking into the rooms of Al-Anon. And I'm so grateful because it was in Al-Anon that they showed me how I can love my son but let him go, that it was his journey. And then my oldest son had different problems. The disease of alcoholism had affected him differently. And Russ began to try to take his life. And he began to cut on himself because he could take the physical pain but he couldn't take the emotional pain. And I was dying in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was dying. And I understood my son, Russ. Because, you see, I'm a person who has had huge bouts of depression. I suffered a lot of depression for a long time in and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Until I picked up a book that's AA-approved literature. And it's right back there on that literature table. And it's called The Language of the Heart. And Bill has a letter in there that he wrote in 1958, right before he was 24 years sober. And he talks about depression. And he talks about that he found the answer, that I cannot have my dependency on anything. I cannot have faulty dependencies on anything. The only thing I can put my dependency on is God. And it was through that that I realized if I put my dependency on God and work with others, it'll save my life. It took him 24 years to find that out. I was 12 years sober when I found it out. I am so grateful because today I understand that. But I understood my son's depression and I understood his desperation. And I wanted to help him and I was powerless. 
I was absolutely powerless over what the disease of alcoholism had done to my son. And what I had to do was know that he was God's kid, the same as my youngest son, who was an alcoholic and a drug addict. He was God's kid, and it was their journey, and I had to let them go and have their journey. And I had to believe that God would take care of them. But see, the test came from me and the trust I had with God. I could give God my marriage. I could give God my alcoholism. I could give God my health. I was terrified to give God my children. Because if I give God my children, I am afraid he'll take them. But what happened was, is I finally surrendered my children. And great events have come to pass. When I was six and a half years sober, my youngest son called me on the phone and he said, Mom, I want what you have. And six and a half years before, he did not want what I had. Six and a half, six and a half years before, I was supposed to attend a function at his school. And he said, Don't you dare show up at my school because I am ashamed of you. And six and a half years later, he wants what I have. Great events that have come to pass. If you're sitting here today and there's somebody you love and they're in pain and they're hurting themselves and they're suffering from alcoholism and it's either they're drinking or they're suffering from the disease of alcoholism in some way, I just want to say to you, just don't give up hope. Don't ever give up five minutes before the miracle. My oldest son will be 44 years old next month. I am 63 years old, and I have been in AA 27 years. And my oldest son has had a miracle happen in his life two years ago. Two years ago. And my son just couldn't find his way, and he's had a lot of psych psychological problems, true psychotic illnesses. And I've been be you can't make a grown person go get help. It's their journey. You can't make them go get help. And Dave and I would make suggestions to Russ and make suggestions to Russ. And two years ago, he came to us and he said, what's the name of that doctor? And he went to the doctor and he's been, he's been seeing him and he's been medicated properly. And Russ married a Catholic girl. And you see, I had all these you know, all these things planned for Russ. I knew the Al-Anon sponsor he needed to have. I knew the Al-Anon group he needed to go to. And what, what happened for Russ was, is that he found his spiritual path, and it's the Catholic Church. And what I've learned is, is that my children have a higher power, and it's not me. <laughs> and I'm really grateful for that. Dave and I have five grandchildren, and uh, well, we really have we really have seven, but we only see five, so we have seven grandchildren because Dave has two from his uh, daughter. But we haven't gotten to see them. But he's going to get to see his uh, one of his grandchildren next month, and uh, but we have seven grandchildren, and five of them we see all the time, and we have been blessed. And our first grandchild was born in 1993, and he was a little boy. And I'm telling you, the heavens opened up when we got this little boy. And uh, miracles. It was wonderful. There is nothing in the world like being a grandparent. And you'll never know till you are one. If you could have just bypassed the middleman, you know, and gone straight to grandkids. It's just fabulous. <laughs> And the, thanks to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a child abuser. I abused my children. But thanks to you, I am a dynamite grandma, an absolutely dynamite grandma. And the miracles that have happened as a result of those kids. When Ryan was, not, when Ryan was 18 months old, we got some devastating news. We found out that Ryan was profoundly deaf. And I had my fist at God. How could this be happening? 
Don't you see how much service? Here we all were sober in the rooms because Kelly's sober too. Kelly's sober 14 years. James is sober 20 years. Dave and I are sober. How could this be happening? But you see, one more time, our perception of reality is distorted. We had no idea what God was going to do. But in order for us to be able to communicate with our grandson, we had to go learn sign language. Do you know how many deaf people are in AA? Thanks to Ryan, I've had the opportunity to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous to four deaf women. Great events will come to pass. We never know how God's going to use us. And now we have four other grandchildren. And let me tell you another miracle that's happened with our grandchildren. Our children let us keep their children. They leave us with their children. That's because of you. They trust us with their children. The miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dave shared with you Friday night that we lost one of our sons a year ago in November. And we hadn't seen our daughter in 15 years because she'd been out doing what women do to keep an alcohol and cocaine habit going. And now she has two years of sobriety. All our kids are home. God is good. The big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says, left to my own devices, I'll self-destruct. The very best I could do was get me a seat in Alcoholics Anonymous. But thanks to you, I'm the woman I've always wanted to be. I am a woman who is faithful to one man and have been for 23 years, and I could never do that. I am a woman who's self-supporting through her own contribution. I'm even still self-supporting because I have retirement, even though I don't have to work anymore. I am a person who came to you and learned about commitment. Be committed. Be involved. I learned about that in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. But the place that I had always felt like such a failure was that as a mom. And a few years ago, my sons came to me and they said, Mom, you're the mom we always wanted you to be. And that's a great event that has come to pass. When I got sober in Center Hospital, one of the counselors used to start every morning with a prayer. And I'd like to finish my AA talk with that prayer this morning. I sought my God, my God I could not see. I sought my soul, my soul eluded me. I sought my brother, and I found all three. God bless. I love you.